Hey guys, this is the sixth segment of uh, chapter two uh, in historical geology. This is Dr. Anna. Um, here we have to start talking about the fossils. And we already have mentioned it, that the fossils are basically the remnants of, of prehistoric organisms. Uh, they will mostly occur in sedimentary rocks. However, it could happen that sometimes you can find them under volcanic ashes ashes or in between layers of volcanic acid, ashes. Um, of course, they are extremely useful to tell relative ages of, of the layers, but geologists also use them as, as environmental indicators because, you know, um, cacti only lives in desert climate or or certain trees, you know, like the pine trees live in certain environments. So the, the different organisms live in different environments. So they are very useful for environmental studies too. Uh, and then of course, probably one of the most important uh, part of the usage of fossils is that they give us some of the evidence for organic evolution, especially when they are already extinct, because that tells us about um, how did they occur, in what order, and how did they evolve, and so on. So now let's talk about the, the fossil formation. And we have already mentioned um, that to become a fossil for anything is almost impossible. So I want you guys to understand it even more that you have to have extremely special conditions to be able to get fossilized. Just think about what happens with a bird um, when it falls down, when it dies. What happens? Seriously, think about it. Yeah, basically it doesn't have any chance to become a fossil. Like, what are the places where they can easily become fossils? Just think about it. Yeah, we just talked about the volcanic ash. When volcano erupts, ash comes down, whoever was there is going to die and going to get fossilized, possibly. What if somebody goes into an ice avalanche? Yeah, nobody can get to it, so therefore it has a relatively good chance to get fossilized. What if, what if you fall in the water and then you get covered by sediment? That's a good chance, too. So you have to understand that most of the places on Earth, there is just no chance for becoming a fossil. So when it does happen accidentally or, or you know, with, with very good luck, it could be preserved as, as unaltered remains, which means that they have not changed. They regain, uh, retain their original composition, everything. Like it could have happened by freezing or mummification, or it could be like in the amber or in tar, possibly. But most commonly we have the altered remains where, where the composition is changing throughout time. So most of the fossil where you actually see the body of the fossil is what we call body fossils. Body fossils are the remnants of the organisms uh, and mostly it contains the skeletons or some durable part of the body which, which is uh, usually solid, so it's able to be preserved. Or the other chance is the trace fossil. Trace fossil is when the organism gets preserved. Not the organism gets preserved, but it's traces, like nesting place, like um, tracks, burrows, sometimes the nest, sometimes even the feces gets preserved. And when that happens, we call it coprolite, actually. This is the... In your slideshow, I, I just accidentally deleted that slice, and it shows really good feces of some animal. It's in your slideshow, so don't worry about this missing. Uh, the coprolite actually helps us to tell about the diet of the animal. It really helps us a whole lot of things. So now if we look at the unaltered remains, this slide shows you actually a... Uh, uh, Insects preserved in the amber, and you know that uh, if you looked at the Jurassic Park movie, this is where they talk about getting DNA out of these um, mosquitoes being locked in the amber. But 
I want you to think about how much chance these insects have to be preserved in the amber, really. I mean, I one time went to uh, camp at Cracks Creek, and as I was sitting under a pine tree, I saw the sap going down. I mean, of course, you know, you don't see it going down because it's going really, really slow. But what I saw is that a, a mosquito got stuck to that sap. And then it made me start thinking about it. Okay, this mosquito poor thing gets stuck to it, but then it has to get covered up completely. Then the tree dies and falls down. You know, it gets completely uh, decayed by oxygen. So the amber has the lost sap gets to get hard. It has to fall off, and then it has to be covered up. That little piece of amber. Just think about. Then when it gets covered up a lot then a geologist have to go and find it. I mean, so you know how hard it is to do all this. I mean, it's it's almost non-existent, even though we say it's such a cool thing that it's unaltered completely, but to become an unaltered fossil, and then for a geologist to find that, it's almost impossible. But here is another really interesting animal, unaltered, uh, one of the most famous in the earth, because there is only one they found. And this is a, a mammoth in Berezovka, uh, Siberia, Russia. And this poor little um, mammoth, as you can see right here on this picture, it's only one meter tall and um, just a little bit longer. And it was really a baby. But what is interesting that it had like, you, you, even, sorry. you can even see the hair. I guess I'm tired. You can even see the hair on its legs and on its back. and. Um, the tummy was full of plants and food, which it hasn't worked up yet. So if you plant those seeds, you can actually grow the plants, which is extremely interesting. I already heard that somebody have grown plants out of this, this low mammoth uh, stomach content. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and these are the altered remains. One really good example of the petrified tree stump from Florissant in Colorado. I've been there. It's, it actually, there is a lot of preserved, every kind of plant. Um, the petrified forest is very similar. So what happened, there was this forest there, and then a volcano erupted close by, and it covered the trees with ash, like that high up, that right this high up. And uh, so therefore, because of the, the ash uh, composition, this high up, all the trees become silicified, like they become really, really hard. So therefore they got preserved. So it's kind of interesting. And this slide shows the, the formation of mold and cast. When the, the animal lies down on the sea floor and then it gets covered up and later on during diagenesis, you know, some liquid goes through and dissolves the original skeletal material. So now you got a hole, and later on the hole actually can be filtered, uh, filled up with other sediments. So that's how it's becoming a cast. So you understand there is mold and cast. Mold is when it's an empty hole. Cast is when the empty hole filled up with the with some other material. So when you dig it out, you actually see all the features of the original animal, but the skeleton structure is different because it's 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 just filtered sediment. So this takes us to the fossil record. Uh, and the fossil record it actually is when you look at all the fossils together representing different ages in the Earth history, that is what we call ra uh, fossil record. Just like the rock record, we have fossil record. So this is the record of the previous uh, life. All the fossils all together throughout the Earth history. If you think about it, you know, remember I have told you that the rock record usually has a lot of time gap. We call them unconformities. But with the fossil record, it's the same. Very many times our fossil record has a lot of gaps in it. And actually, it could be even more incomplete than the rock record because of the, the problems with all the, the fossilization we just talked about. But the fossil record, um, in any ways, is extremely important for us because without that, we we wouldn't be able to do a lot of things. So it's very important for us. So this takes us to the 
principle of fossil success uh, or you already had to know this so this is not a big deal we already talked about it I'm just gonna mention it again because for correlation it's extremely important so this just remember tells us that the fossil assemblages succeed one another through time in a regular one-way street so it you can determine it it's always just gonna go in one way there is no turning around fossils won't come back whenever a, a animal extinct that's it you will never see it again it's like a human like whenever a human dies that human will never come back it's the same with the fossils so we cannot just simply match up different rocks because different similar environments will produce very similar rocks so you could not tell time equivalent just by using rocks you have to use fossils to be able to tell that these rocks are exactly the same uh, age so the fossil assembly is also very very unique so this is important okay so we're going to talk about this uh, law naming thing is so we're going to start with the time units when we talk about time units, uh, that is, those are designed uh, parts of the, the geologic time. And uh, the most commonly used time unit is the period. And two or more periods will be called an era. Remember when you look at the, your timetable, these are going to be like right there. So they are going to be on top of the column. So you can see that which one is the smallest unit, which one is bigger and so on. So uh, two or more periods are going to be the era. Two or more era is going to be the eon. And, and then the periods could be actually shorter. You can call them ages or epochs. And then the time stratigraphic units are system and they will correspond to the time unit period. So just remember when we get to the time stratigraphic unit, the system is the most basic unit and that will be corresponding with the, with the period. Okay, so we're gonna get that in one sec. So when we wanna deal with both rocks and time, the termina terminology will um, include two fundamentally different kind of units and uh, we need terminology that deals with both so the rocks which are defined by their contacts are going to be the lithostratigraphic unit this is what's going to work with the rock content and the biostratigraphic unit is what we works with the fossil content and if you if you put the time also in it or relating to it we're going to call it time stratigraphic unit and that means rocks of a certain age and time units which is referring to time but not rocks so let's see the little little lithostratigraphic units, these are hard words, lithostratigraphic units. Uh, and these are based on the rock type, as we just said, and it doesn't matter what is the age of them. And the basic lithostratigraphic element is a formation. So you just have to remember the form formation, and that is the basic lithostratigraphic unit, lithostratigraphic unit, lithostratigraphic, that's the word, lithostratigraphic unit. And that is formation. Formation is a map, mappable uh, rock unit which are uh, destructive, which has destructive upper and lower uh, boundary. And it may consist just one single rock type, such as the Romsche. Remember in physical geology, we went to Fishburn Park, and I told you that this is the Romsche, and you didn't understand. Why Romsha? Now you understand this is a basic lithostratigraphic unit. It's mappable, it has a well de defined upper and lower boundary. So most of Ronok has the so called Rome shell formation. Or it could have variety of rock types. And uh, 
such formation which has different rocks in it is the for example the Martinsburg formation when we go to Catawba I will show you the Martinsburg formation that can have like limestone layer mostly silt some shale so it's different kind of uh, rocks and uh, the formations are the ones uh, which are the basis for making geology maps when you look at the geology map if map in one of the the coming labs you will see that the the basic map units base, basically is the formations very many times the formation uh, can be subdivided into members and beds and you will see on the geologic map that very many times this is the case they will show you the members and the beds and uh, they could be collected into groups and supergroups too I guess I'm going to stop here so I will have one more segment for this chapter. I'll see you.